since running Brainscape now for over a decade, uh, I have come across literally thousands of students, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, and and the challenges that they've had just incorporating cognitive science principles into their curricula in general. Uh, so this is where we we take a step back and and really look at um, the, the basis of of really what memory uh, is. And so a lot of scientists kind of oversimplify. Uh, the types of memory into declarative and procedural. Um, so first, kind of understanding what the differences of these are. Declarative, they sometimes say, is uh, is knowing that, right? Declarative memory, I know that the hippocampus is right here. I know that these concepts are related in these ways. Uh, whereas procedural memory is, you know, learning how, like right? how to write a bike, how to factor a polynomial, how to do brain surgery or, or you know, write a paper. And over the past couple of decades, as many of you guys have probably seen and, and uh, experienced, the pendulum has really shifted uh, toward more and more procedural memory focus and less about declarative memory, almost to the point where you know declarative uh, knowledge has kind of been demonized. Um, you might have heard in a lot of you know conferences or, or you know pedagogical circles, we got to get the drill and kill out of the classroom, right? Uh, we, we've got Google now. You know, why does anybody need to memorize anything? You could look it up. Uh, we need more critical thinking in the classroom, etc. These are our mantras that are that are at every conference, and they're not wrong. Um, the value of procedural memory is uh, is super important, uh, but I think we're we're now kind of coming to this um, awakening where uh, people are realizing that you know there's there's more of a marriage between the two. It's not either or. Um, and, you know, good pedagogy is uh, a question of, of how to kind of combine the right um, mixes of both. Uh, my friend Michelle Miller at Northern Arizona University uh, wrote a great book about this where, you know, three of my biggest takeaways um, about the particular benefits of declarative knowledge are, you know, number one, that knowledge itself is a useful thing. Um, obviously, you know, foreign language verb conjugations and those things were very useful for me. I didn't want to have to look them up on the spot, but knowing what to do in emergencies, sounding smart in conversations, you know, you don't want to have to Google everything. You do want some knowledge. Uh, knowledge can, in a lot of cases, be a prerequisite to skills. Uh, you got to sort of memorize your your multiplication tables before you're, you know, being able to do calculus, um, at least efficiently. Um, you probably need to know, you know, how to diagram where certain uh, organs are uh, on a chart and drill yourself on that before you know, you're doing surgery on, on real live people or cadavers. Uh, and, you know, you're it, just the, the act of, of learning declarative knowledge helps you develop metacognition, which is sort of the, the thinking about thinking, the reflection of, you know, how well do I really know this this concept, which is such an important guiding tool to help uh, any learner, um, whether it's, you know, self-directed or, or through a class uh, going forward. So, uh, thanks to a lot of the defenders of of knowledge uh, and memory over the last couple of decades, there there is now becoming more of of that marriage that I was talking about, uh, where you know knowledge is being seen as more fundamental, but not necessarily meaning that it has to be a prerequisite. Right? We're not saying you got to memorize a whole bunch of trivial facts or dates that may not matter, um, you know, before learning skills. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that it has to happen, you know, without context. Uh, obviously, knowledge and skills, you know, can be can be taught together. Um, so to understand some of the ways to do this, before we get uh, further into curriculum design, I want to break um, the science of learning down in, in one more type of dichotomy to help understand. Um, and this is uh, along two main schools of uh, pedagogy theory. Um the first is behaviorist, and the second is constructivist. So obviously, a lot of uh, behave, uh, a lot of pedagogy theories out there, but these two are, are great prototypes because they're uh, in a lot of cases uh, opposed to each other. Um, behaviorism being sort of the the drill, the the rote, the repetition, uh, classical conditioning, right? Pavlov's dog, um, where you've got you've got quizzes, etc. There could be some skills um, involved in behaviorist drill, so it's not perfectly knowledge versus skills here on this on this paradigm, but it's sort of the way that you that you practice. Um, and then on the right here we have uh, constructivism, 
which typically is, you know, it's project-based learning, it's it's developing critical thinking, collaboration, um, developing your own knowledge and skills rather than having, you know, an educator sort of impart them uh, upon you. As we look at this, it feels so naturally obvious that constructivist activities uh, are more likely to prepare students for the real world challenges of the 21st century, um, that to the point where constructivist um, dogma <laughs> followers um, tend to oppose behaviorism so much as sort of a, a relic of the last century, right? Again, it's the drill and kill, uh, and, and it's often that same um, opposition that you see in the in the skills versus knowledge uh, debates. But the more I've I've seen this and been part of these debates over the last uh, decade and a half of my career, uh, the more I've seen that really what constructivists are against isn't necessarily the the drill itself, um, but it's you know number one just bad curriculum design, right? The memorizing of dates where really the dates aren't important, um, but the ineffective application of drills uh, that lazy students, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, have fallen back on uh, for many centuries. Particularly these, the, these three things here I highlighted uh, in the behaviorist section um, that sort of characterize the, the old factory model of education. Um, and they are right. Um, if you've got just a stream of, of visuals or a lecture or you know, some boring reading where you don't understand why does this matter to, to my life or my career, you're probably not going to process the information well uh, versus if you had used any of these other tactics that you see here on the screen. Uh, but the problem is without good educator guidance, students are going to slip into these passive tactics because they're more comfortable. Right? Nobody ever really taught these students how to study. Uh, so it's just so much less mentally taxing to say, oh, I've got a, I've got a test coming up. I'm going to reread my notes. All right. I'm going to I'm going to review what I highlighted or, or the class notes that my friend took for me and just sort of, you know, review them over and over until I know it. This is what students do, even in some cases, no matter how much we try to teach them how to study. Uh, and they'll even say things like, oh, my, my learning style is is learning things from video. Right which is a debunked myth <laughs> that we just can't get rid of, right? These, these learning styles. Um, maybe students have a learning preference for learning in a, in a passive way, uh, but <laughs> that's because it's the easy thing. There's nobody on the planet that actually learns better watching a video on how to you know, do Microsoft Excel than doing Microsoft Excel, right? And it's just that uh, you know, most students weren't really taught. So... What we're going to do in the rest of this workshop is uh, going to be taking your instructional materials, which you probably already have in one of these linear formats, right? You, you probably have your own lectures or videos or, or readings or even podcasts or something like that. And how do we actually turn them into constructivist activities and, and maybe with a little bit more active learning? Um, you notice, though, here, these two other things that uh, are number four and five in the behaviors column. I have it labeled them passive. These things, active recall and retrieval practice, are are actually active learning, even if uh, behaviorist, and uh, they represent an interesting opportunity. So let's let's first look at um, what active recall means. So the the sample I gave before, when we're talking about public tender, right? We did multiple choice. Here's another multiple choice question: How do you say government contracting in Spanish? Well, you might see options. How might I see this? And in this case. Uh, option B is the right one, la contratación pública. But if I had not seen these options, if somebody just said, how do you say government contracting in Spanish? And I had to think about it from scratch. That's active recall. Your brain is working a lot harder. Um, you might not even know it at all from uh, the first time you see it. So you're going to you're gonna get it wrong and then you're going to be corrected. Uh, but this actually ends up being such a deeper way to process mentally uh, the information than if you're just recognizing the answer on multiple choice. You know, we, we fall back so much on multiple choice uh, as educators for an assessment because it is, you know, have a scantron, right? You can very quickly uh, assess uh, if students knew something well, and, it, and it's decent at that. But as a review tool, as a learning tool, 
uh, recognition uh, versus actually working hard to, to actively retrieve it is not an effective study tool. And this is why flashcards um, or, or even flashcard apps, you know, whether it's Rainscape, whether it's Anki, can be such an effective learning tool when combined in a better ecosystem. Uh, so we'll get back to, to those things later. Uh, the second thing I want to uh, show here is um, re about retrieval practice. Uh, and first, it helps to understand the, the forgetting curve a little bit. Um, many, of you guys, many of you guys have seen uh, Erman Ebbinghaus's famous forgetting curve from the, from the 1800s, uh, where you see how a, a concept tends to erode quickly uh, after the initial exposure. So, uh, you know, you, on minute zero, right, you, I just taught you something, um, you knew it 100% well. Uh, but very quickly, you're, you're forgetting it to the point where after a week, you might have forgotten 90% uh, of, the, of the facts uh, that you were, you were initially exposed to on this day. Unless you had some sort of retrieval, right? You're, you're losing 90% uh, of what's taught. And that's been shown in so many different um, types of, of uh, scenarios on average. Um, and what's happening, um, you know, when, when you do retrieve it, especially if you retrieve it at the right time, is that... Uh, your hippocampus is signaling to the appropriate region of your cerebral cortex. This is probably important. If we're having to use this knowledge or skill again, uh, whether it's a test question or an Excel formula or a heart surgery technique, you know, we're probably going to need to know it again in the future. So let's, let's build a stronger neural connection so that it's even easier to retrieve uh, in the future. Um, in other words, each retrieval event sort of shifts out the forgetting curve for that particular concept. So now that I've re retrieved it once, uh, now I have a new forgetting curve. Uh, it has a, a less of a steep slope. I'm going to forget the information less quickly than I would have before, such that each retrieval uh, promotes uh, better retention. And this is why you, you sometimes hear uh, retrieval practice um, used synonymously with with the term distributed practice, um, since you're sort of assuming that uh, if you're having the students retrieve the information mentally uh, over time, it, that they're probably doing it distributed uh, over over days or weeks, et cetera, um, and therefore not having to, to start back at zero, forget the whole thing completely and start back at zero. Uh, so these are the kind of backdrops. We're going to talk uh, about how to put distributed retrieval practice on steroids uh, with technology later, uh, but you know, looking back at our uh, constructivist versus behaviorist lens, um, we can we can then kind of put the pieces together. We can look at sort of how active recall and retrieval practice can be practical complements to the constructivist activities that we saw here on the right. Because when you do constructivist activities. They tend to be uh, masked, as they as they say, right? You're doing it all at once. Um, it's hard if you if you do a really great class project um, that you know you do it in class or you write an essay. It, it took you you know six hours to work on over a couple of days. You can't um, then say, okay, well now you know two weeks later, let's just sprinkle in a, a five minute review of that class project, or let's let's sprinkle in you know a, a three minute review of that skit that we did in class. Um, you know, X weeks ago, it doesn't really work that way. You know, really good constructive act activities are holistic, they're collaborative, they can they sort of are, are done best in class. Uh, and so the active recall and retrieval practice, if you can create some sort of a tool or artifact to allow that, that practice uh, ends up being a really good complement. So maybe you're, you're introducing uh, certain new concepts through great constructivist activity, you're giving it purpose, but you're using the behaviorism as a way to, to keep that memory uh, retained and built on itself. And it becomes uh, a foundation for our mindset of how to apply these, these concepts in a curriculum. 